All right, if you will, uh, start coming back in here and uh, grab your snacks, grab your food. <clears throat> now, following William's presentation, we will be dismissed for lunch. And you will have a two-hour lunch break. We wanted everyone to have just a little bit of an opportunity uh, to relax and to rest before we continue for this this afternoon. And we do have a very full afternoon. We do have another break uh, in there, but it will nonetheless be a, be a pretty full afternoon. But uh, just want you to know that you do have two hours for lunch, but do not miss this afternoon's proceedings. You just don't want to miss out on that. For those of you who have been attending the Predators Pilgrim Weekend for any time whatsoever, you really, honestly, William Bell doesn't need any introduction to you. You already know, and I've introduced him every, every year as one of the best friends I have in this world. He is a trusted confidant. He is a man that I have relied on in times of discouragement and times of disappointment and times of just, you know, needing to talk to somebody. And I trust his wisdom. I trust his knowledge. And I know how deeply he loves the Lord and loves his word. And uh, it's always, always a privilege to be able to introduce to you Dr. William Bell. William. Mike's on, so I'll just put it right there. I'll let you hook it up. HDMI cable. so I can go to lunch. <laughs> Those of you who have hearing aids, you may take them out. <laughs> All right, I think we, we're set here. Let's see. I'm not even sure I know how to do this. On I think it's play on the Mac, right? Is that it? Play? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, is it still morning? Good morning. All right. Um, so deli delight to be here always. And I'm grateful. And the audience is great this year as well. Um, thanks to Chad for all the technology. Thanks to Don and Jan and all of their team for putting this event together. Uh, it's always a blessing to be in the company of fellow uh, preachers and comrades who have to face um, some of the things that we face as we share this beautiful message of God uh, and fulfill uh, covenant eschatology. Uh, the, just the awesome vision of God's glory and grace when we see what has been accomplished in the scriptures. And then uh, the awesome burden that we have in trying to communicate that message to others in a way that they can understand and oftentimes walking away feeling frustrated because we have not been able to break it down simply enough for them to grasp it or we take too much of that responsibility on ourselves when we have to realize that they have an obligation too to uh, apply themselves to understand, to desire uh, the Word of God so that they can, uh, they can grasp it. My topic for this 
uh, 45 minutes is the terminal generation. And I'm gonna do uh, my best to keep it simple uh, as best as I can and, uh, and get through as much of the material as I can. I hope I'm able to, uh, to finish it and to complete it. So it's possible that you'll find a nugget or two that will help you. And if that is the case, then uh, this seminar will have been worth your while as far as my participation is concerned. As we look at the introduction, we have the meaning of the term this generation, which is a critical uh, t point or phrase that is used in connection with our understanding of the coming of the Lord. And we have examples in both the Old Testament and the New Testament on the phrase this generation, which is a reference to the terminal generation, and I hope to establish that as we move forward. So uh, our questions that we ask is, you know, what specific generation is referred to in the New Testament? Because there are uh, many who ascribe it to so many different things, as you probably heard already and will continue to hear. How the Bible has used generation to define and limit the fulfillment of prophecy. So it becomes a part of the framework for eschatology in that it will limit the time frame for the fulfillment of all things. And then we'll look at some interpretations and objections that are given by others to consider those in light of what we will present today. Now, when we define the term, and I just copied these directly from the internet so that everybody could go and check them and see precisely what they say. They may be too small for you to read there, I'm not sure. But uh, the term generation means all of the people born and living at about the same time, regarded collectively. Um, as an illustration, they gave a little phrase from a sentence, one of his generation's finest songwriters. Now I know we are of all ages in here and uh, many of us have lived through several genres of music. Uh, one of the most, you know, I, I remember a little bit of the 50s music, a little bit of the 60s music, but my generation was the 70s, mu the 70s music, and I still love it to this day. You give me some earth, wind, and fire, and you'll watch me jam a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, on through the 80s, and then the 90s, and of course, we're up to the music today. Uh, and so that's the reference. The, each, each decade almost had its own genre of music. And so that's what it means. A, uh, all the people born and living at the same time, or uh, a particular genre or generation of music, if you please, an age, an age group, a peer group, people of the same generation. The, uh, the second definition is the production of something or the creation of something. So just as you sit down and compose a piece of music, you are creating it, if you please. And, um, and so the creation of something in both of those terms uh, or both of those meanings are found within the scriptures. Um, another rendering of that definition, the entire body of individuals born and living at or about the same time, the post-war generation, if you please, uh, the terms of years, roughly 30 among human beings. I think most Bible scholars will uh, say around 40 years, but you know that just helps us to see just how brief a generation is. And then... Um, the same thing in the other definition. And then when we look at the production of something, we can go to the book of Genesis because in Genesis chapter two, it says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. And so here we're talking about the time of creation, the time that God made these things and he uses the word generation, actually uses it in the plural to speak not of just one thing that was created, but of all things that were created. And so here we have that second use of the term generation, the production of something, in this case, the creation of the world and all things in it. Uh, this same idea exists in the term, that is, of these definitions that we've given, in the term regeneration, because it's the recreation or the rebirth of something. Just as Job 14 and 14, uh, when he talked about uh, that he would wait until his change or until his regeneration would come, all the days of his appointed time. And we have that text in Matthew 19, 28, and also uh, Titus 3, 5, that talks about the regeneration. So we're talking about a new uh, creation involved in those particular texts. But the first one that really gets into 
uh, an application to the eschatology that we are discussing would be found in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1 where the Bible says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous in, notice the phrase, this generation. And so this first definition of the term, a group of contemporary people all born and living at the same time comes into play in this particular text. Now we ask ourselves, when did Noah and his family enter the ark? Was it in some future generation yet to come? I don't think so. But it was in that very day in which Noah was living. As a matter of fact, the Bible says uh, after seven more days, the flood would come. And so Noah and his family entered the ark within that day, within that time, in that generation. It came seven days after God made that announcement. Not thousands of years later, but in that very same generation. Verse 4 says, For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And so that phrase, to me, refers to all the things that God had reference to in Genesis 2 and verse 4, when it talks about all the things God created and made. And so he says, Noah entered the ark in the 600 year of his life. So Noah is still living. He was told that he was going to enter within his generation. He's still living. He entered in the 600 year of his life. And then he exited the ark or came out in the 601st year of his life. So all of that, as far as the flood, took place within the lifetime of Noah. So we can see an example of the use of generation in this particular uh, text. Uh, these were people living in the time of Noah, and Noah lived in the time of that generation. Now we have another example from Moses, and we look at the generation of Moses, but we have a prophecy that introduces that to us in Genesis chapter 15, uh, verses 13 through 16. So here we have a specific generation referred to, but it is clearly not the generation that was living in the time that the prophecy was given. It specifically lists the precise generation in which the events would occur as the fourth generation. That is the fourth generation from the time of the prophecy. When you look in Genesis 15, it says, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. So this was not going to happen in the time of Abram's generation, not in the time of his life. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, how God distinguished between, or note rather, how God distinguished between this generation in this particular case, uh, as far as Abraham's generation, and then four generations down the road. And so, clearly, Noah's events, as we saw before, were within Noah's own generation, which was called this generation. But, as far as Abram is concerned, these were not for his generation, but they were for the fourth generation that was to come. Now, while we're here, let's talk about a 400-year prophecy. Now, some of you probably have not heard. Let me just take a quick survey. How many of you have heard about the 400-year prophecy? I'm not surprised <laughs> uh, that so few have heard about it. Well, this is a Hebrew-Israelite group. And by the way, I have a book called Shipwreck Faith, Deuteronomy 28. And uh, if you don't know what the that's right is for, every time they quote a script and think they made a point, they shout out, that's right. So I wrote the book and I shouted out, that's right. <laughs> At any rate, um, it doesn't necessarily deal with the 400 year prophecy, but let me tell you just a little bit about that because it applies to our study today and particularly to this prophecy of Abraham. Uh, so there, this particular group, I, if I recall correctly, but I know they're scattered around, um, is out of Chicago, and they believe that the count for this prophecy in Genesis began in 1619, from the time that the first slaves were brought to Jamestown, Virginia, during the time of the transatlantic slave trade. And so they have been on a 400-year countdown 
which ends next year. You know, I just love these kind of things. <laughs> I do. I wrote, I, I did a video on the end of the world back when um, uh, we mentioned him in this seminar. Larry, I think, mentioned him. Um, camping. Thank you. Harold Camping. Uh, made those prophecies in May and I think October of 2012. Well, I put out a video that nothing was going to happen in 2012. And some smart guy got on there. He says, oh, you don't know anything. You see, the, you made this video after all of these events, after these prophecies took place. I said, look, wait a minute. I said, go back and look at the video. I did the video in 2011. <laughs> he missed that. And so, and pointed out nothing was going to happen. Well, the same thing is true about this prophecy. This 400 year prophecy is not going to come to pass. And I'm just waiting. I mean, I, I, I engage with these guys all the time uh, on Facebook and I've had a couple of debates with them. But at any rate, they're waiting for the year 16, I mean the 2019, for them to be delivered out of America, which they believe is Egypt according to Deuteronomy 28. Now you can see the connection of, of the book that I wrote. And, uh, and so they look at Europeans as the Edomites, even though that was Jacob's brother, <laughs> strange thing. Uh, but here's, here's what I found. This is an interesting point. Researchers have discovered that the first slaves came to this country from Angola, Southwest Africa in 1607 <laughs> on a Portuguese ship, according to a Washington Post article published September, uh, and I must have erased the, the date because I had it in there. But anyway, it was a few years back. I think it's uh, about six or seven years ago that they published that article. And they're doing this research as we speak, which means that's just shot the 400 year prophecy because they should already be delivered if that was gonna happen. I told them if they wanna get delivered from America, get a passport, a visa, and a plane ticket, and you can go. <laughs> Nobody's holding them at any rate. And there's the, there's the link so you can get that from the notes. Now, when we look at the biblical fulfillment, in the fourth generation, the Bible tells us that Israel sojourned in Canaan 215 years and in Egypt for 215 years, according to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 40. And that pretty much agrees with Paul's 430 years for the giving of the law, because after they came out of Egypt, God gave them the law in Sinai, according to the promise that was made uh, in Genesis, uh, excuse me, Galatians 3 and 17, and of course the promise in Genesis. Now, if you look at this in a very simple way. You got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his 12 sons, Levi was one, and that counts down to four generations. Now, if you wanna be even more technical and say, well, the generation that came out of Egypt uh, died, and so you still can count four generations if you even start after Abraham. So we're not gonna argue over that if you wanna be that specific about it. But the point is, it's very simple to see and to count the four generations. And so if you look at Levi, uh, who was the son of, um, of, of Jacob, uh, Kohath, Amram, and Moses, uh, four generations or one generation beyond, since all in that generation died in the wilderness, is what I was just saying, then you can see very clearly that the Exodus occurred in the time of Moses, and therefore four generations after. And that's exactly what the prophet said in the fourth generation. And so it's easy to count these things. And even if you did a little simple math here and took 215 years for their sojourning in Egypt, uh, it would make a generation roughly about 54 years. But remember, they lived a lot longer than we do. And uh, those numbers had begun to go down. So uh, that's what you have on that particular uh, point. Now, the Bible says that this was approximately 40 years because Israel's sojourning, according to Hebrews 7, uh, 3 and verse 7 and following, it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and saw my works for how long? For 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So the Lord's anger, was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And so that entire generation died in the wilderness. But that was the same generation that was delivered out of Egypt, according to Exodus 12 and uh, the other text. All right, now we get to uh, 
a text in Deuteronomy, and it's hard to pass by this text and not just hunker down. I tell you, <laughs> it's, it's a good one. And I recommend it to everyone to go study. But at any rate, what we're going to look at here is just a couple of passages out of it. Because what happens here is Moses prophesies not for his day, but he looks all the way down to the end of Israel's uh, covenantal life, if you please. Uh, Old Covenant Israel's covenantal life. Now let's, let's look at a, a passage uh, before in Deuteronomy 31. And uh, notice in verse 28, the Bible says, gather to me all the elders of your tribes and of your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know, watch this, just like he told Abraham, that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I've commanded you. And evil will befall you when? In the latter days, in the last days. And he goes on to say, um, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your own hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel, the words of this song, and they were ended. So we're talking about things that are going to happen after Moses' death, when Israel provokes him, and also when they will become utterly corrupt and therefore uh, in the last days. I understand that there was some provocation of God uh, even before then and that God destroyed them in the time of Babylon, sent them into captivity, but he's talking about the ultimate of their uh, provocations. And so when we look in verse five, the Bible says they have corrupted themselves. This is chapter 32. They are not his children. So they have become so corrupt that he says, you're no longer my children because of their blemish. And notice what he calls them, a perverse and crooked generation. That's very, very specific. And it is identified in the New Testament. He talks about the fact that they had begotten the one who fathered them. He says, of the rock who begot you, you are mind, unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. So we're not talking about any time in the beginning. We're not talking about any midpoint. We're talking about Israel's end, the end of old covenant Israel. Now, it's also interesting that um, in this context, because Peter draws from Deuteronomy 32 quite a bit in his writings, particularly in 2 Peter chapter uh, 2 and 3. But I wanted to just note, since he mentioned the fact that they, um, that they had forgotten the God who fathered them, and Jeremiah also talks about that, you've got forgotten me days without number. But Peter said, but there were also false prophets among the people. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, um, in the next text that we want to look at, Psalm 102 and verse, one, and verse 18, the Bible talks about things that would be written for a generation to come. And he's still pointing to the time of the terminal generation, the time of the last days. And I just want to mention just a couple of things here rather quickly. All right. Uh, since he says it was for a generation to come that a people yet to be created. So not old covenant Israel. We're talking about a new covenant Israel that was going to be created according to this text. And so it's important for us to see that this was taking place within the first century generation. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul said, therefore, from now on, there should be now on, and uh, his point of reference is the death of Christ. Christ had died for all. And see, one of the things that happened in Jesus' death was that Jesus was reborn from being made under the law, under the old covenant, and therefore begotten of God, this day have I begotten you, rising from the dead as a new creation in Christ. I said a lot, covered a lot. I'll just throw the scriptures out there because I'm trying to save a little bit of time. But that's Colossians 1.15. That's Acts 13.33. Um, Colossians 1.18. Revelation 3.14, the beginning of the creation of God. And uh, Psalm 2.7, which is where the quote is from. And so from that perspective, Notice he says concerning those who are believers in Christ. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, because he is the beginning, the first fruit, the beginning of the new creation of God, anyone who is in Christ becomes a part of that new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Peter, again, refers to that in uh, 1 Peter 1 and 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And Peter tells them this same group that had been born again of the incorruptible word of God, he says to them, you are a chosen generation. So this generation that he was talking about that was to come was existing in the first century. And that has uh, implications, of course, for the terminal generation of which we're speaking. I'm going to move on from that. And uh, we have this text in Ecclesiastes 1.4. I'm mentioning it because I'm going to use it perhaps in uh, discussing the objections just a little bit. But the Bible says one generation passes away. And, and it should also help us to understand a generation. But he says one generation passes away. And another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. So generations will continue to uh, come and pass away. They will continue to pass and another generation will come. And this is going to continue world without end. Now, when we get to Matthew, we find a text in Matthew that uh, tells us a bit more about the generation. And, and, you know, Matthew uses the term generation the same way throughout the entire book. But he starts in verse 17 as he lists the genealogy of Christ. And in verse 17, he, he sums it up and he says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David unto the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Now, if you do the math on that, 14 times three, we end up with what? 42 generations. Now, I don't know where you put the uh, birth of uh, Isaac. I know, as far as I understand, the call of Abraham was somewhere around 1921 BC. And uh, Isaac was born uh, when he, Abraham was 100 years old. So somewhere within that time frame, 1900 to 1800 BC, give or take some years. If you were to divide that up by 42 generations, you would come to an average time frame for a generation of about 45 years. And uh, depending on which number you use, it could be less. That's a pretty close average. I don't think anybody would fight over that, given the fact that those men lived a lot longer than people live today. And so it basically confirms the idea that a generation was about 40 years. Now, we have within that time frame, the coming of John, who was Elijah, who was to come before the great and the awesome day of the Lord. John the Baptist, Elijah would come before that great and terrible day of the Lord. Matthew 3, 1 is where you see uh, in the book of Matthew, where you see John the Baptist uh, introduced. And, uh, but in Malachi uh, 3, 1 and chapter 4, 4 through 5, Isaiah 40, uh, Matthew 17, 10 through 12, and Luke 1, 16 and 17, you see that the Bible confirms that John was the Elijah who was to come. Now, here is what John does when he comes. He announces, he comes, first of all, to the terminal generation, and we'll see that. But when he comes, he announces the about to come wrath of God. You know, when he saw the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he says, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee the wrath about to come. So he announces the coming of the Holy Spirit for the last days, which was for the terminal generation. He announces the judgment and the terminal destruction in unquenchable fire. We've already heard uh, uh, someone speak about that. Brother uh, Bundar, Alan Bundar spoke about it. And, um, and so we see that uh, the judgment was to come and this is something that John announced. And so he called him a brood of vipers. Now, what is a brood? It's a family of young animals, especially of a bird, could be of snakes, uh, could be of any, you know, uh, family of animals, but they're all born or hatched at the same time. So John was using very specific language when he said to them, brood of vipers. Uh, he wasn't just talking about 
every single, I mean, every generation to come, he was speaking of a single one, and he called them a brood of vipers. Vipers are very, very poisonous snake. And therefore, re referring to their character and to their spirit, to their attitude, their conduct regarding the word of God. Uh, synonyms for that, for brood, would be offspring, young progeny, family, the bird flew to feed its brood. These were all little uh, baby birds hatched at the same time. Now, when we look at that, the text says also in Matthew 3, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. Now, the root is the foundation and life or food support for the tree. To cut off the root and to burn it in the fire sounds pretty terminal to me. This is John announcing the destruction of the terminal generation. He has to be talking about that last generation of old covenant Israel. He goes on to say his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It was a judgment that could not be abated and um, that was their final fate. There will never be another old covenant Israel. Now let's look at what we've stated uh, and uh, look at uh, additional passages on this phrase, this generation. Because what John does is he links, or what the Bible does is it links John's message to Israel, to this generation, to the terminal generation. Jesus said in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 11, but to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. For John came, see, he's talking about John who came within that generation. He says, to what shall I liken this generation? That's the generation in which John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has demons. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and wine bibber, a friend uh, of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. So note the connection between John's coming as Elijah and the phrase, this generation. Remember, John was to come before the great and awesome day of the Lord. But coming in that generation, therefore, would identify it as the terminal generation. Jesus also spoke of this perverse and crooked generation, this adulterous and sinful generation in Matthew 12, verses 38 through 42. He said, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you, not a sin from you. Boy, I missed that one. All right, but anyway, you got it. Uh, but he answered and said to them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment, notice, with this generation. Now, this also helps us to understand that even though it was a generation that was going to come upon Israel in those days, it was not a judgment that was limited to Israel only. Because he said the people of Nineveh would rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Same thing for the queen of the south or the queen of Ethiopia will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. We have again this uh, phrase where we have a connection between Peter and Matthew on the generation and particularly referring to the judgment. The Bible says in the latter verses, 43 through 45, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Sometimes when we capture these phrases that are used by the apostles, they will help to unlock 
uh, the meaning and connect passages that we may not have seen connected before. And so, once again, he says, so shall it be with this wicked generation. Now, what generation was he speaking to? This was the one that desired of him a sign. And the one that he said no sign would be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, I don't think anybody here has seen Jesus walking around trying to give you that sign. Uh, he did not die in our generation. That was a long time ago. And that's why we have to keep these passages in their historical context and setting as has been so well demonstrated. But let's notice also in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. The scripture is talking about these false teachers. It's talking about those who are persecuting the church. And he says, these are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it also appears that they have been those who had uh, obeyed the gospel, but they have turned away. They are apostatizing from the faith. He says they are again entangled in them and overcome. Now remember what Jesus said. He said their house had been empty, it had been swept, and it had been garnished. They had been cleaned up. But they go back. And he says, and the last state of them was worse than the first. And Jesus identified that as that wicked generation who saw the sign of his crucifixion. Now notice what Peter said. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Peter is talking about the same group of people. And therefore, in his judgment context, he's identified them as these uh, Jews in the first century, as Israel in the first century. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Uh, same thing in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. I'm not going to take the time to go through that. It's basically the same thing of Matthew 12. In Matthew 17, 17, Jesus just clearly points out that the generation to which he was speaking was the perverse and faithless generation. He answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with them? No, he wasn't pointing to the future, was he? He wasn't looking out some 2,000 years uh, beyond his day. He was there with them at that particular time. That's what Matthew identified. He said, the book of the genealogy of Christ, that's what he was leading to when he started with all those begats, beginning with Abraham. He was coming down to Jesus' generation. And so Jesus asked them, O oh, faithless generation, or, and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? And thus bring him here to me, of course, uh, about to heal uh, the person. And so, uh, again, this, this is a very clear text, very specific, very precise, that identifies that perverse generation as the one uh, that Jesus was among. Now, in Matthew 23, Dunn has already uh, alluded to this, that... Um, Five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Serpents. Matthew 23, 33 through 37. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of Gehenna? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. All these things will come upon this generation, same generation. It hasn't changed all the way through Matthew. And so here's Jesus in the last days uh, of his life, speaking to them in the temple setting and saying this, and we don't find anyone who disagrees, at least I haven't run across any, of any significance to note that will disagree that this was the generation living in the time of Christ. We get universal disagreement even among the dispensationalists, among the amillennialists, etc., that this is that generation. But here's what I want you to note. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now watch this phrase. See 
your house is left to you desolate. Now, what did Jesus just do? He just connected this generation with the temple. Now, this is a very critical point. It's very, very critical. So let's take it a step further. In Matthew 24, which we have some who say all of it is the same context, some who want to divide it. I had one elder tell me Jesus weaves in and out from one text to the other. <laughs> but let's note something. He said, assuredly, I say to you in verse 34, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, we've had, you know, many people who will say, well, everything in Matthew 24 from verse 1 down to 34 is 70 A.D., and they won't give us any problem with that. They will agree that Matthew 23, 36 through 38 is the same generation. And so, Matthew 24, 34 is clearly the generation living in the time of the temple. Now, some of the dispensationalists have a problem with trying to make these chapters 70 A.D. because of their stance, but we're going to just see how this works out. In Luke 21 and verse uh, 32, we have Jesus again saying that that generation wouldn't pass till all those things were fulfilled. But what he does in verses 20 through 22 is he connects that generation in Luke 21 with the destruction of the temple in verses 20 through 22. And so what we have, therefore, is the temple from Matthew 24 15 through 18, Matthew 23, 36 through 38, Luke 21, 20 through 22, and also verse 32, that ties together the terminal generation and the temple. But there is Matthew 24, 36, which supposedly divides the chapter. Well, here's what happens there. In claiming that that is a future coming, they ignore the fact that this is the coming of Christ, but that it too is connected to the temple. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 through 6, when the Bible talks about the coming of the Lord, and I don't have time to develop this, Don and I have been talking about this, but the man of sin was sitting where? In the temple. Let me say this to you. There is no other temple that can qualify. There is no other generation that can qualify to be associated with that temple that was existing in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I'm going to write a little book on this called The Terminal Temple. And if you look all through the New Testament from Matthew even to the book of Revelation, that temple is connected to every eschatological passage in the New Testament. And it forms a part of the framework. Well, I'm out of time, I think. I don't have time to go any further. I can't touch the objections, but let me just say very quickly. If you're going to make the... Word generation refer to races, just think about, there were 42 generations in the family of Abraham alone. So that's 42 races. If you're going to make it um, a race, then you have to understand the Bible says one generation passes and another comes, but the earth abides forever. Why haven't all the existing generations passed away and we get some new ones? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, William. Absolutely wonderful. Great word study. Great contextual study. And, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't know how anybody would answer that kind of stuff. Uh, I deal with an awful lot of people a, a lot of the time. But that kind of consistent contextual application is what has a tendency to convince people of covenant eschatology. All right. Going to, going to be dismissed. And you can go enjoy lunch. Remember, you have a two-hour lunch period. Uh, be back here at the time on your schedule, and we will pick right up. If you would, bow with me for a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we come before you again with grateful hearts. We thank you so much, Father, for the dedication of these men that have shared their hearts, their minds, and their learning with us. We ask you to bless that learning to our hearts and lives and help us to be earnest and zealous 
sharers of that word. Thank you again for this time. We ask you to bless the food that we're about to participate. Bring us back. Continue to bless this weekend. Thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.